Hi everyone, hello, uh, good day, good morning, good evening, uh, good afternoon, wherever you are. We wish you all happy, healthy, and thank you for joining the Geoscience and Geoenergy webinar of 14th of January 2021, the second webinar of this year. Uh, today, we have the pleasure and honor to host Professor Rosaline Archer from the University of Auckland. And as you have noticed, this is the first ever webinar we have hosted that has started at six in Central European time. Uh, no wonder why. So uh, Rosalind is the director of the University of Auckland Geothermal Institute and acting deputy dean of engineering. She holds a PhD in petroleum engineering from Stanford University. Uh, our last speaker was also uh, Ronan Hall from Stanford, so uh, the two of them are uh, quite good colleagues and friends. She holds a PhD, as I said, in petroleum engineering, and uh, she worked as an assistant professor in the petroleum engineering department of Texas A&M University before returning home to New Zealand in 2002. At the University of Auckland, she works with students at all levels, from first-year students in a compulsory subject on energy and society. Uh, by the way, before the webinar was started, she was explaining how she does experiment uh, with the kitchen stuff, uh, uh, especially when you are teaching to uh, younger students at the first year uh, uh, bachelor level, then you need to do some sort of experiments uh, for them. And all the way to students in the interdisciplinary master of uh, energy program that she leads. Uh, and also to PhD student level working on geothermal energy research. She won the Society of Petroleum Engineers Regional Distinguished Achievement Award for Petroleum Engineering Faculty, uh, Asia Pacific region in 2011, and was the first New Zealand based engineer to be awarded the position of distinguished member of the Society of Petroleum Engineers, SPE, in 2015. In 2016, she won the Deloitte Energy Engineer of the Year uh, Award, and she is a fellow of Engineering New Zealand um, and also uh, was elected deputy president of that organization uh, just last year, 2020. It's our uh, pleasure and honor to host you, Rosaline. Thank you very much for graciously accepting our invitation and be flexible so that we are now having you at 6 Central European, 5 p.m. British time. Uh, to the audience, uh, thank you for joining again. Please note her lecture will last for about half an hour, 30 minutes. Uh, 31 minutes would be okay also or so, so you're not that strict, so no high pressure. And after the lecture, uh, Sebastian, like always, would share the discussion session. Please do type chat in the chat box your questions. Uh, and after that, Sebastian will go through them as well. Do not wait until the end of the talk. Whenever you think appropriate, please type your question because that might trigger other questions and, and we are looking forward to a lively discussion session as well. Without any further ado, as uh, Rosaline, the stage bandwidth, the screen is all yours. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you for the very kind introduction. It really is my pleasure to be online with everybody this morning, my time. I don't mind getting up early to do it. Um, the original invitation, though, would have been 4 a.m. my time, and we renegotiated. So the work I'm presenting is around a theme of data integration in geothermal reservoir modeling. Uh, and it comes inevitably from uh, myself, but with a large cast of PhD students, colleagues, collaborators around the world. So I do specifically want to acknowledge the three PhD students whose work forms the backbone of the talk. So Alberto Adid, Dr. Angela Prieto, and Nona Talte. But there is an even larger cast. So I just couldn't help but start with a, a map of the world as, as I see it. Uh, New Zealand there being uh, in the centre and up the top and being six o'clock in the morning here. So a very good day to you, no matter what time zone that you end up watching this in. So as it was mentioned in the introduction, uh, I am the director of the Geothermal Institute at the University of Auckland, and I just wanted to take a moment to introduce the Institute. And it really is a, 
an interdisciplinary umbrella on our campus. It's um, an activity that coordinates all our geothermal expertise right across that campus. And we have people in engineering, geoscience, law, business, social science, and we all love geothermal. The other thing I wanted to very quickly note in terms of the research and the tools that come out of the Institute is our major open source modeling code contribution. So YWERA is our new um, heat and mass transfer code, uh, essentially a, um, an equivalent, a replacement, an alternative, if you like, to the, the tough family of codes, but it is free and open source. Uh, is performing very, very well, and some of the models that we build in the team with it are probably some of the most complex three-dimensional geothermal models in the world. So if you want to know more about it, it's called Waiwera, which is the Māori word for hot water, and it's available on GitHub. But I'm actually not going to talk too much about reservoir simulation. That is my, my heritage. My heritage is very much in terms of numerical methods, numerical modeling, numerical reservoir simulation. But for a, a geoscience theme series, I wanted to showcase some of the work that I do with people who are interested in both geoscience and in the environment. So as a, a quick visual outline, I'm going to take you on a journey from uh, Bayesian inversion of um, the subsurface, looking at MT and methylene blue integration in terms of data integration. Uh, so that's at large scale. There we're thinking of understanding volumes of rock that are kilometres across. In the middle section of the talk, we'll, we'll go you know, right to the poor scale, where I will showcase some work from Angela on textural uh, identification in geothermal and, and rock typing. And then in the image on the top right from our, our National Archives, I have um, some traditional use of geothermal, uh, Maori women cooking in geothermal waters. And there I have what may be a, a surprise take on integration, thinking more about values and worldviews between our Maori community and our Western community in New Zealand. So they're going to be three kind of tasters of the work we do here in the Institute. Inevitably, if you want more detail, um, I'm probably better pointing you to some of the published papers, et cetera. So on with the show. So in the first section, I want to introduce Alberto's work on Bayesian inversion of magnetotellurics using methylene blue with structural priors. So as those of you who are into geothermal geoscience will understand, uh, MT, magnetic telluric data and inversion of that data helps us image the, the shallow conductors that are typically associated with a clay cap in a geothermal reservoir. But like any inversion process, that can suffer from non-uniqueness and uncertainty. And uncertainty is a big deal for decision makers because when I think as a a modeler, ultimately what my quest is as a modeler is to help reduce uncertainty and reduce risk and make better decisions. Not necessarily to solve a model to three decimal places. So in Alberto's PhD, we've come up with a Bayesian inversion method that integrates electrical um, resistivity distributions from the MT surveys with methylene blue, which is an indicator directly of conductive clays. And that methylene blue uh, is used to inform a structural prior for the MT uh, inversion process. Apologies, these slides are slightly uh, text-based. Uh, there are some images coming though. So by incorporating the, the borehole information, so the borehole information being the methylene blue, uh, we're able to reduce our, our non-uniqueness in the inversion. And uh, we use a, a Monte Carlo, Markov chain Monte Carlo process in a, a three layer model uh, to locate uh, the clay cap. And there's inevitably work to be done to get this process to um, true uh, 3D. So there's a, a bit of um, 
work in the inversion thinking about what you can do in 1D, 2D and 3D. So the case study inevitably comes from Wairaki, Wairaki being one of the oldest and most studied uh, geothermal fields in the world. So we go right to the heart of the North Island. So the map in the bottom left hand panel has um, empty stations in blue and wells with methylene uh, blue and red dots. And inevitably they're not quite in the same place. So there, there is a bit of work to be done in terms of reconciling that and some underlying interpolation of the um, methylene blue data. So we use this to create a um, structural prior. So the methylene blue is used to create a structural prior. So here in the figure, we have methylene blue concentration on the y-axis and depth on the um, x-axis in meters. And it's fitting a square function to locate as a, a prior where the clay cap is in terms of a, a top and a bottom depth, Z1 and Z2. And then that goes into an MCMC um, process. Uh, so we've got uh, the construction of that um, process on the screen there in terms of rating uh, MT observations um, with the resistivity in the three layers to the structural prior um, from the methylene blue. So, does it work? It's always what people want to know with these things. Well, inevitably the first thing that you do is you try it on a, a synthetic. So we constructed a um, synthetic uh, MT, uh, did the inversion on that without any um, methylene blue prior. So the image in the top, uh, it shows you what happens uh, and the, the sort of width of the zones marked out in red and in blue show the uncertainty in um, different runs of the process. Uh, it, there is also marked on there in the um, sort of purple coloured lines the true contour of uh, the conductor uh, which is the light brown and the um, black outline is a different inversion process from a um, MT inversion software. So that's good but not great. And then in the bottom panel when we introduce our methylene blue priors, uh, they have constrained the uncertainty quite well and they've given us an inversion result that is much much closer to the true um, contour of uh, the low resistivity zone. We do this on our Wairaki case study. So here in um, the Wairaki case study, we have um, the well names going across the top where we had, um, sorry, the, the MT stations. We have methylene blue uh, stations across the bottom. So those blue panels across the bottom are saying, where did we have methylene blue measurements? And where are they um, laterally? So the distances are saying um, where are they in relation to this particular cross section. And again, we see the same pattern as we did on the synthetic, that integrating the methylene blue data reduces the uncertainty on where that clay cap's located. And that then should uh, be used as really valuable information to reservoir engineers, reservoir modelers who are history matching models like this uh, to make sure anything they're doing in the history matching is guided by as much geophysical and geoscientific data as possible. So if you want to know more about the nuts and bolts of exactly how we drive that process, uh, we have an upcoming paper coming out in Geophysics, so Alberto Adida, PhD student, will be first author on that, co-authored by um, folks at Wairaki, uh, collaborators in France as well. But it's, it's a really fun piece of work and a nice piece, I think, uh, of data integration. The next piece of work that I um, want to introduce to you is inspired in many ways by the petroleum industry. So as um, in the introduction, I have a PhD in petroleum engineering. 
I do most of my work these days in geothermal, but I do still maintain a, an interest in and a connection to uh, the world of petroleum engineering. But the world of petroleum engineering does have, you know, many kind of key differences to geothermal. And many of those spring from, you know, just the value of the fluid. What is the value of one barrel of geothermal fluid versus the value of one barrel of oil? Uh, so there's people around who've, who've come up with the, the economic value of a barrel of geothermal fluid is on the order of a US dollar a barrel. And that influences then some of the data gathering efforts that happen in geothermal. Um, you don't see the abundance of coring, of special coring, of, of logging, of, um, you know, many of the other tools that are, are deployed in, in oil and gas systems um, just because of the economics. So we wanted to find ways to maximise the value that we could get out of rock samples and think about what people could do uh, with hand samples, with rock cuttings, with things that may not uh, have the opportunity to have a lot of detailed um, core analysis and laboratory measurements. So this uh, led uh, Angela Prieto, who was my PhD student at the time and also a, a geoscientist who'd come into the world of engineering. So she has a PhD in engineering and she was again motivated by wanting to help engineers build better reservoir models, but reservoir models that really honoured the geology, honoured the kind of textural fabric of the rock. So she was quite inspired by um, the kind of flow zone indicator techniques that are common in um, oil and gas. So what she did is she built up a database of um, rock sample data uh, that comes from two geothermal fields, Salak and Tahara. Um, Tahara is in New Zealand. Uh, and she looked at textural descriptions. What could we actually observe about the rock samples? And did a lot of kind of screening statistics on understanding what those textural descriptors would correlate to. Because she knew that the reservoir engineers, what they want is permeability and porosity. They don't typically want to know about rock texture. So she came up with um, four key textual descriptions in terms of the degree of consolidation, ground mass, pore volume, and pore filling material. And then came up with a classification scheme that um, with those four descriptors can be used to classify uh, any sample, or at least any sample in her database, into what we're calling a, a petrotype. That is a relationship between permeability and porosity. And then we've got regression fits to give actual models to say if you've only got um, porosity, uh, you can get to permeability. And if you haven't even got a perme uh, porosity, sorry, um, we've got a visual catalogue to help you estimate porosity and then permeability. So there's the data. Inevitably, people want to see the data. Um, the data there is uh, in terms of porosity on the x-axis, permeability uh, using a log scale on the y-axis, and the data there is coded in terms of illite versus smectite, just to give you a sense of the data set we were working with. And it's inevitably a smaller data set than would be ideal, but again, the abundance of data that was available, data that had the measurements, um, was not, not there. So these uh, samples are all uh, classified into a database uh, and after all the kind of screening statistical work, we've got these four observations that we believe are the most important. And then there is a workflow uh, in terms of sorting those into classes based on the four observations and it's sort of a decision tree. I tried to put it in the slides and it just wouldn't reproduce particularly well. But that decision tree was built, uh, the first version was built uh, using self-organising um, map-based tools uh, to help guide the process. Um, and Angela's also looked at um, artificial neural networks. But what the um, classification tree uh, process did 
was build these three petrotype trends. So the slanted lines on the diagram, again, porosity on the x-axis, permeability on the y-axis, give us groups of um, samples that have comparable textures within those rock types, PET1, PET2, and PET3 for petrotype 1, 2, and 3. And they're also coded now, color-coded on this one in terms of lithotype as well. So you see lithotype has some relationship to the petrotype, which is not, um, not of course, surprising. And then each of those petrotypes we've fitted with their own relationship between um, permeability and porosity. So this becomes a very valuable tool uh, for modelling, for populating properties in 3D models and for history, um, history matching those models. Or for reality checking any changes that uh, reservoir engineers who aren't being guided by geology might want to make. So again, if you want to know more about the work that we've done on um, textural identification and rock typing, uh, including uh, you know, further instalments on this of work done with electrical logs, I didn't encode the electrical log stuff because the, the images of electrical logs I find very frustrating to look at in a PowerPoint presentation. I always need to tune my, uh, tune my eyes in, in more detail to, to get good stuff out of them. Uh, but if you want to know more about it, you can search Angela's work on the IGA database. And then the final thing that I want to speak to in terms of integration is in many ways much less quantitative, but extremely important. So this is something that is unique to New Zealand and is special to New Zealand. And I, I want to speak to the work going on in the Institute, uh, led by a, co a PhD student, Nona Taute, who I co-supervise, on Maori values in geothermal. And Nona is doing what to me is extremely important work in terms of working through understanding the Māori worldview in geothermal and the Western worldview in geothermal, the underlying value systems uh, and the identify, I, indicators and metrics that, that sort of measure performance against those values. So I am including this in the, in the wider spirit of data integration. Um, and it, it's work that has received quite a bit of interest in New Zealand. Nona's first uh, conference publication, for example, um, won you know best student paper in uh, last year's well, 2019 geothermal conference here. So to give you a little bit of an overview, and this this is a very light touch overview into stuff that is that is really quite um, uh, quite quite deep. Uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand, has an abundance of geothermal resource, as you know, and Māori have lived and benefited from this resource since their arrival in this country in the early 1300s. So as a Westerner, I am a relatively recent arrival to this country. And the, the connection that Māori have to our geothermal resource is not only physical in terms of, of bathing and swimming and cooking and medicinal uses of the resource, but it is a truly spiritual connection. So there is a whole value system around Māori interaction with geothermal that governed their management of the resource uh, before the arrival of Western um, beliefs, Western management systems. So I really want anybody working in the geothermal sector in, in New Zealand to understand Māori values and anyone working in the geothermal sector in another country to understand the, the cultural values associated with geothermal in that country and to integrate them into the work they do to make sure those values are understood and not overshadowed. So Nona's work um, first came up with kind of three groups of Māori geothermal values. And the first one he calls wairuatanga, or spirituality. And in brief, uh, the text on the side speaks to uh, the Māori worldview in terms of why Māori believe we have geothermal activity in New Zealand. 
And that goes back to um, the god of geothermal, of earthquake and volcanic activity, Rumoko. And Rumoko generates forces underground whenever he pleases. And especially um, in terms of if he becomes agitated or spiteful towards human intervention, then those forces underground can be, can be damaging. And Māori also have uh, a belief around why we have geothermal in New Zealand. Uh, and that belief dates back to um, underground heat uh, being delivered to New Zealand uh, to uh, warm uh, Maui, who was, who was a, a key ancestor uh, who is believed to have fished up the North Island of New Zealand. So geothermal has this deep spiritual connection for Maori. In terms of what that looks like in terms of, of values, um, there are values here listed on screen around access to culturally important sites, around acknowledging sacred sites, around preserving those, around protocol when you're doing geothermal resource uh, research. And that protocol applies to everybody working in this field in New Zealand. If you're going to do Māori, uh, if you're going to do geothermal resource research well in New Zealand, you have to understand Māori protocol. The second kind of basket of, of values that Nola came up with around the customary benefits of geothermal. Are the benefits shared equally? Do we uh, ensure health and safety? Do we ensure that medicinal features, therapeutic properties are maintained? So in terms of, you know, why am I talking about this as someone who is a reservoir modeler? Well, you know, some of those customary benefits in terms of um, access to systems, uh, in terms of, you know, that relates to surface features. Are hot springs going to stay at the same temperature, at the same flow rate, the same chemistry? Subtle changes in those surface features can be very significant for these communities, and we have to honour that. And then the, the final um, area of kind of Māori values that Nona speaks to is around what's called rangatiratanga in terms of Māori ownership, government, authority and autonomy. Um, so that speaks to, in, in modern times, Māori um, role in resource consenting for projects. And as a geothermal reservoir modeler, our uh, forecasts of you know, how systems will be performing, how sustainable they are, they go up to our environment court to obtain resource consent. But we all have to acknowledge the importance of Maori governance in that process in obtaining those consents and try to put uh, that knowledge and that value um, on a, a par with kind of Western science. And then the, the final one that I've highlighted there, and each of these three sections of Nona's work have um, more, more detailed lists of sort of values associated with them, are around um, Maori traditional knowledge, preserving that. Um, and that there are many places that can be integrated into Western science. But we also, in terms of um, Western science, have a have a an obligation to try and uh, support Maori communities to maintain and, and build that knowledge. So, in terms of building building the knowledge of young people, so that's obviously one of the most exciting parts of um, being in the university yeah, to help support the development of our country's young people. So what Nona's work is doing at the moment is something that's really building those bridges. He, he has mapped Maori cultural values. He has some other work where he's mapped um, quantified kind of Western science values in terms of things we can see and measure. Are geysers flowing? Are flow rates in hot springs unaltered? Are chemistries in hot spring, springs unaltered? Is the um, diversity of um, uh, flora and fauna in a particular landscape changing or staying the same. So Nona has a very extensive list now 
of values that spring from Western science, of things that we can see and measure in our context. And his work is ultimately producing a framework that integrates the two to help uh, everybody understand both value sets and both worldviews. So I think this will be, um, when it's finished, a tremendous contribution to the geothermal industry here in New Zealand and has implications for other uh, Indigenous peoples around the world. Uh, so there is um, more detailed journal publications hopefully coming out soon, out uh, going through the final phases of review. Um, so that gave you a taster of three different things we have been looking at in terms of integration of all sorts of geoscientific knowledge and values here at the Geothermal Institute uh, in New Zealand at the University of Auckland. If you'd like to contact me anytime outside of this forum, um, there's a range of channels to reach me there. But um, from here on, I'd be happy to take some questions online. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rosalind, for the uh, lecture. Uh, I'd like to just uh, hand over the stage to Sebastian to start asking you the questions. We already have some questions posted, so please, Sebastian. Yes, thank you very much, Rosalind. It was really interesting. I'm particularly intrigued about the work that you've done with the Maori and a very different look at, at what sustainability means um, to different communities, mm -hmm. different people. I'm going to start with um, um, the some of the questions. So. Farad asked, thank you for the presentation. Could you please elaborate on the types of data that's used for history matching? The types of data for his history matching in general or yeah. specifically? In, in, geothermal, in geothermal, as I was. Sure. Yeah, so in general for history matching, um, similar sorts of things in many ways to what you would use if you've come from a, a petroleum engineering background in terms of um, well uh, flow rates, but obviously energy matters, so you would be thinking about what enthalpy you're observing at wells and what chemistry you're observing at wells. So chemi chemistry signatures at wells can be really interesting for history matching. How common is, a quest for me is how common is history matching? It's something I haven't come across that frequently in the geothermal, I mean, oil and gas is standard, but in the geothermal side, I haven't come across it that often. Um, it's something that my team spend a lot of time on. My team do do a lot of commercial consulting work and build models of producing geothermal fields all over the world. So yeah, if you've got producing data, it's very common to history match. Okay, okay, that's good. That's good to know. Thank you. Um, we do have some questions around so the reservoir rock typing here. So Diana um, was greeting us from Denver. It's an interesting concept um, about using textual features. Your question is, does the permeability estimates, um, are they considered as in situ permeability? Do the modeling, does the modeling include mechanical properties and or stress parameters? Yeah, very good question, because obviously the permeability that you want for a reservoir model is that in situ permeability that includes the sort of geomechanical considerations. Um, more a matter of the permeability that you can get. So in terms of uh, the samples that we had, um, those permeability measurements weren't necessarily done at in situ conditions. Um, you may only have air perms at uh, you know, low confining pressures. Uh, so you would have to correct for that. Okay. So staying um, on the topic of reservoir rock typing, um, Josh is one of our PhD students, um, who works extensively on reservoir rock typing from the audience. She asked the questions, given the limita limited amount of borehole data, how accurate is the reservoir rock typing technique and conceptualization facies maps for the cre creation of 3D models in the geothermal industry? Is it more flexible than the oil industry? Um, yeah, I mean, that good good question i i think very very hard to know how how accurate it is because we can obviously never you know fully image what a true true 3d system is is like and i think you know in some ways the details of getting it 
exactly right in terms of understanding exactly where there's porosity and permeability, it's probably less important in geothermal because in oil and gas, you know, the it's that volume of fluid in the system that you're interested in. Whereas in geothermal, it's it's the heat and the sort of conductive transport of the heat um, that is perhaps less sensitive to the distribution of permeability and porosity. So I think we can we can accept <laughs> uh, a bit less accuracy uh, in some ways in, in geothermal. I think that goes back to um, one of the earlier talks we had last year with Mark, where Mark Bentley talked about oh, yeah. it. Um, the idea we need to see the reservoir, the fluid sees it, and the single phase flow is almost always more forgiving in terms it of the, of the biology than than a multi phase flow yes. system. The um, a number of questions coming in around um, the inversion that you have talked about to begin with. So I start with a question from Denise, and there's another one from Ali. It's very similar. So Denise. Um, thanks you for the great talk. Regarding the first part of the talk, which sampling method are you using for the MCMC analysis? Um, and how do you determine the li your likelihood? Um, I probably best to I could I could send Denise a uh, pre uh, pre publication version of the paper if she wants. Um, so the the slides I did cite the MCMC sampler as being one that was presented by Foreman and Mackey in 2013. Um, but yeah, probably probably easier if I try for a copy of the paper. Okay. Um, so thanks for offering to send that. Or I guess Denise will contact you then on, on the- We could add it as a comment later. Yeah. Um, Ali has a similar question um, and he wonders, have you just done Bayesian inversion or have you looked at other types of inversion as well? Um, I mean, the material, um, the material I was presenting was, was just a, a Bayesian inversion. Okay. Uh, we did, uh, we did compare it to the results from, um, a standard MT inversion software. There's, uh, I'm just trying to think about this slide. There's some lines on there from what you would get out of an MT inversion software called Mod EM. But we were specifically thinking Bayesian. Okay. Um, jumping gears now, um, 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 yeah, changing gears quite a bit and jumping <laughs> yeah. from literally across the world now is really <laughs> interesting for a question for the people on, on our side of, of the <laughs> um, continent. So what do you think about geothermal energy in countries without volcanic volcanic activity? Not everyone is as blessed as New Zealand. <laughs> um, so or volcanic subsurface characters like the Netherlands, what are the main challenges in your view here developing geothermal energy in say, Ge Germany, Netherlands? UK. Yeah, well, I, I hear a lot of great stuff, especially about the Netherlands in terms of what people are doing in terms of geothermal. Um, and I think thinking laterally about geothermal. So in New Zealand, we are blessed with this geology that makes um, high temperature uses, electricity generation um, very available to us. But in countries like the Netherlands, we are you're likely to have lower temperatures. I mean, some of the direct use applications I'm hearing about there are fantastic in terms of heating greenhouses, um, district heating for homes, um, industrial uses of the heat. So I, I think we do have to remember that that geothermal isn't necessarily about you know building large electricity generation stations. Um, obviously, you know some of the challenges will be. Uh, I think for me and in any country that's newer to geothermal is just the risk profile. So one of the things when people look back in terms of why New Zealand has done so well is we had a lot of um, government funded exploration, uh, you know, that led to um, understanding our kind of geological endowment, if you like. 
And that government sort of funded exploration was geophysical survey and geochemical, all with standard sort of geoscience work, but also actually going out and drilling wells. Um, so there's a huge number of wells that were drilled by our government and that de-risked the projects um, so that it was much easier for commercial players to pursue geothermal. And I think where we see you know, a number of countries struggle is the risk profile for a commercial entity mm. is sometimes too great. So I think countries that do it well, um, you know, they de-risk through government efforts and then they're very transparent about sharing the data. Um, so I would I would anticipate, you know, data sharing is probably relatively well done in, uh, in Western Europe, uh, less, less well done in, in some other parts of the world. It's really interesting and, and I'm sort of, sort of hogging part of the, the discussion here, but one example that's always cited here in, in Europe, Western Europe, is Munich, where they have done the 3D seismic, they have done the reservoir modeling and that helped them to de-risk yes. geothermal development. Just so as a follow-up question, again, because we talked about the history matching um, in the past, so, so do you think these low temperature direct heat use applications, is there still the scope for so the more dynamic reservoir modeling that we know from the in the history matching that we know from the oil and gas industry and that we apply for New Zealand or is it much more sort of in an analogy sort of shale gas industry you drill the well you put if you're lucky it produces unlike if it's if you're unlucky it doesn't but just the cost um, of doing the additional modeling work and characterization work is too expensive um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm obviously biased because I, I like doing that kind of work, but I, I think it, um, I think it, sh it, you know, it can be done relatively cheaply and and should be adding value um, to, you know, to, to help the whole kind of de-risking conversation and to really think about um, under understanding the systems in terms of understanding what what you're getting. Um, and you know, perhaps planning ongoing development. So yeah, I mean, even if something is being produced out of something relatively simple, like a large pot sedimentary aquifer, um, I, I think it's still worth modelling. Huh? I'm glad to hear because I do like the, the modelling side as well, as does as Hardy. Um, so we want to be kept busy with the modelling and the simulation. Um, Here's a really interesting question from Mohamed Rabai. Hi, Mohamed. Um, good to see that you're online. Um, thank you for the exciting futuristic presentation. In terms of geothermal reservoir forecasting, do you still use relative probability data? Um, what other parameters do we need for the forecasting side? Yeah, so it, it, naturally, if you're getting into two-phase flow, so if you have a system that's boiling and you have steam and brine flowing, uh, you do need relative permeability data. Um, and I have another um, student who looked um, quite specifically at relative permeability implications for um, enhanced geothermal systems where you may be putting um, large volumes in, of water into rock that hadn't been water saturated. So, um, you know, initially wetting those geothermal systems um, potentially has some interesting relative permeability questions. Um, so there are there are there are plenty of important issues there. Um, you still have um, you know a role for capillary pressure um, in terms of the dynamics of flow and fractures. Um, in terms of other, um, so this question is thinking about other history matching parameters. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Governing, uh, parameters. governing parameters for forecasting. Um, in thinking, you know, much like oil and gas, how you're going to operate your wells. Um, and one one thing that we've seen in another project is quite important is um, gas evolution from the fluid. So geothermal fluid will have dissolved carbon dioxide in it. Um, in some systems, that dissolved carbon dioxide is very low. In other systems, it can be relatively high. Um, Turkey, for example, has typically very high CO2 in their geothermal fluid. So you get into two-phase flow dynamics in the world war. So the fluids flash. 
Um, so in terms of forecasting the performance of the overall system going from reservoir up the well bore through the plant, um, understanding the chemistry of what's, what's in your fluid, where it's going to come out, um, how that's going to influence the well bore dynamics is actually really important as well. Okay, that's really interesting. So lots of geochemical work to do. That sort of takes us to now segue into so the next two questions. Um, I mean, ladies first, so Diana, the second question, in your opinion, what are the main needs in terms of data integration for the next 10 years that geoscientists should focus on? So you mentioned geochemistry, um, what else? Um, I mean, I think what we, what we will see taken more seriously um, is things like tracer, tracer testing, like in, interwell tracer testing um, is going to help understand flow pathways a lot better. Um, interwell tracer tests are inevitably slow and complicated and, and keep the modeling modelers busy, but if you're looking at um, flow related questions, um, I think we will see an increase in the geochemical side of things. So understanding the evolution of permeability as things like silica drop out of the fluids. So you see silica plugging up pore spaces. So the pore, the permeability in geothermal systems can actually be really dynamic. Um, so I think over the next decade, we will get, first of all, we'll get better modeling tools, but we'll get better data on um, understanding um, the sort of geochemical aspects and how that has an interplay with uh, reservoir engineering. That's really interesting. And you know, there's again sort of lots of experience how you deal from the oil industry, how you deal with prevent scale formation. And um, yeah. so, one question here from Kashif and thanking you for the presentation. Which advice would you give to young researchers who are new to the field? Do we all need to learn TUF2? <laughs> or you could learn my wearer. Yeah. Um, to, to be fair, neither neither why wearer nor tough two are particularly easy to learn. Um, I mean, they they don't have nice graphical front ends. Maybe one day we'll we'll write one for our simulator. But um, we're um, I think just like learning any simulator, whether you've come from a geothermal background or, or an oil and gas background, I would want to, people to learn from the ground up. Learn from simple models where you know the physics, you know, 1D models, uh, column models, radial models, 2D models. Do, do very simple models first and make sure that you understand the physics, you understand how that's been reflected in the, in the model file setup. And then I think the other angle to that is once once you do get yourself able to build more complex models in, in any simulator, getting good kind of pre and post um, model workflows to bring bring in data. Uh, so geoscientific data, you know, whether that's structural, permeability, porosity, whatever data set you've got, think about getting good tools to get the data in, but also the post-processing. So I, I very much see the future of, of reservoir modeling as one where we build um, and run more models to explore uncertainty, as opposed to building one super detailed 3D model and saying, that's what the system looks like. I'm going to run as many cells as will fit into the memory of my computer, but I'll only run it once. I, I very much believe in you know, coming up with a workflow that might run smaller models, but run more of them so we can really acknowledge and explore more of that uncertainty. So that typically takes a bit of IT skill. So we, uh, in our group, we also have another open source library called PyTuff. Uh, so PyTuff is a Python library that helps you talk to Tuff2. And if you know Python, it does take some of the pain out of dealing with Tuff2. So high tough stuff there available on GitHub as well. Great. Thank you very much. And um, again, so thank you for also a big believer into looking at um, uncertainties rather than building the one big model um, that is precisely wrong rather than approximately right. And yes. again, to quote Mark Bentley, what, what we end up 
then there's two things we don't understand, the reservoir model and the reservoir itself, so which isn't a good, good situation. Um, I think that's all the questions we had from the audience. So thank you everyone mm -hmm. in the audience for asking plenty of questions um, and the interest in the talk. Thank you, Rosalind, for your time answering them so diligently and engaging with the discussion. And Hadi, over to you for yeah, some thanks final very much. comments. Uh, thank you uh, for the very nice and lively also discussion to the audience as well. I did uh, enjoy a lot when you said, Rosalind, uh, to start to understand the process and simplify uh, before jumping into too complicated systems that you don't really know what is what is going on or can't really characterize uh, the simple uh, heat transfer mechanisms even in the system. So uh, very nice. Uh, I would like to just take the chance and uh, introduce our next week speaker. We are actually uh, going to now to the East Coast US. Uh, we are hosting next week Professor David Whites from Harvard University. Uh, David is going to speak about pore scale studies of multi-phase fluid flow in micro model porous materials, porous media. So until next week, we go back to the normal times of 4 uh, p.m. Uh, in Central European time, 3 p.m. British time. Rosaline, I hope you could watch perhaps later. I, we wouldn't expect you wake up at 4 a.m. <laughs> I guess they would be fine as well that if, yeah. But uh, please, everybody, we are going to be back to the same time zone of 4 p.m. Uh, Central European time. And we see you all next week. Stay happy, healthy, and tune in to our channel for the next week. Tom. Thanks, Rosaline. It was an amazing and very inspiring uh, lecture today. Thanks. Thank, Thank you very much, Rosaline. Thank you, everyone. See you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.